JoJo's Bizarre Adventures is considered to be one of the greatest manga and anime series period, with many believing Part 7 in particular to be a genuine masterpiece. But while JoJo's today is held in such high regard by so many fans as a beautifully vibrant series with an odd but unique approach to storytelling, dialogue, fights, and character designs, it wasn't always such a well-developed package. In fact, out of every anime and manga I have ever personally experienced, JoJo's Bizarre Adventures had, by far, the longest journey to becoming what I would consider to be a truly well-written series, starting off with Part 1 as an extraordinarily unpolished manga that was missing nearly every significant literary element that most would consider to be important to storytelling. However, part of JoJo's unique appeal is that it is split up across so many completely distinct parts such that despite its polarizing beginnings, the author has, over the years, had the opportunity to do something that most other authors can't. He has had the chance to continually do a soft reboot on the same series over and over again, while continually getting to improve on his formula. Meaning that with JoJo's, more than any other series I know of, we are actually able to observe an exact step-by-step -step evolution of an author in clearly traceable segments. With each part, we can see Araki improve as a writer in some specific area, bit by bit adding a new piece of storytelling mastery into his repertoire, such that with every single part we get not only a new story, but the opportunity to see how this author has grown in some new way. All leading to today, nine evolutions deep into JoJo's at a point where Araki is considered by many to be a creative genius. So let's look back at this step-by-step -step evolution and see how each part of JoJo's improved in some writing aspect from its predecessors. Note this is not to say that every part is better than the last, just that each part clearly added something that the previous ones lacked. So let's get into it. Starting with part 1, Phantom Blood. While Phantom Blood is often looked at as an extremely basic story compared to future parts, it did establish one crucial foundational component that would carry through every part from here on. That is the titular, bizarre feel to the series. The grandiose style of speech, the absurd character designs, the ridiculous fighting styles that are all seamlessly woven together with the more heavy dramatic beats and character motivations. Such that it's all supposed to simply mesh together without any real acknowledgement of the weirdness that permeates the otherwise serious story. This is the distinct style that makes JoJo's JoJo's. It is the style that most fans tend to fall in love with, to the point that diehards will argue that even part 1 is great despite being such a basic storyline, simply because it is the origin of that classic JoJo style. However, Part 1's simplicity beyond that touch of style makes it seem extremely primitive compared to future JoJo's. The plot is unbelievably straightforward, there aren't exactly many compelling character arcs or surprise twists, and even the action is tame by JoJo standards. The bare-bones nature of Phantom Blood is probably best represented by the extremely one-dimensional protagonist, Jonathan. Part 1 depicts good versus evil in the absolute most cookie-cutter manner. Jonathan is pure good, Dio is pure evil. Jonathan's primary personality traits are simply that he is a brave, noble, honorable man, whereas Dio is selfish, greedy, and power-hungry. There's not much more to either of them than that. And while that may be enjoyable to some readers, I think most would agree that this is not a trend that can carry an entire series. Which brings us to the biggest step forward that Part 2 took. If you ask anyone who their favorite JoJo's protagonist is, there is a good chance that Joseph Joestar will be at least in everyone's top 3. And I think most would agree that he is easily the single most immediately charismatic and likable JoJo. With Joseph, Araki was able to take a step forward in how he writes his protagonists, shifting away from the generic Jonathan and taking a bold step forward with a more rough around the edges hero, which would become the standard for most JoJo's from here on. Gone is the pure goody goody cardboard cutout protagonist from part 1. With Joseph, we now have a cheater, a rogue, an underdog, an improviser, a loose cannon who is never afraid to play dirty to win. While Part 2 doesn't have that much better of a plot than Part 1, Joseph is the first and arguably only JoJo in the entire series who manages to carry the entire part on his own, as his charisma brings a sense of fun and excitement to every single scene and battle. 
Essentially with part two, Araki mastered the art of writing a great protagonist and created an iconic character in the process. And along those lines, part three took a huge step forward in writing character ensembles. Whereas part one and part two focused on barely two to three main characters at a time, and most of them outside of Joseph were honestly somewhat bland, part three onwards embraces the idea of a diverse and zany cast of main characters that all have their own quirks, abilities, and absurd personalities. This makes it so the hero no longer has to carry the part on their own. Rather, the group dynamic as a whole is what brings most of the charm to the story and keeps us coming back. It's interesting that while Jotaro is the Jojo that plays the biggest role across the entire series, he has the smallest role relative to his own part, as Stardust Crusaders really is about the Stardust Crusaders as a whole. From part 3 onwards, each Jojo's part is defined by at least three main characters and usually more. But what many don't realize is the actual reason that Araki was suddenly able to diversify into writing ensembles, and really why it was better to start adding in more characters. And that was the introduction of Stans. This is the other, even more significant area in which Araki took a step forward as a writer in Part 3. The previous power set, Haman, is probably a more well-structured ability than Stans, but that structure made it too limiting. More rules make it harder to think of fights, and with Joseph, Araki was probably already stretching the creative limits of Haman's applications. So the solution was to do away with the rules, and come up with abilities that could essentially be anything. Stands. That meant greater variety in terms of what fights could be, which in turn meant Araki could write more heroes so that he could have more stands to play with. Now it might sound strange to call stands a step forward in writing development, but in the context of a battle manga, which every JoJo's part is, yes, coming up with an innovative power system that becomes a staple of the series that the author can regularly go back to is an essential part of writing. Stands are often the first thing that people think of when it comes to JoJo's, and many would argue that they make for the single best power system in all of manga and anime as they make for limitless possibilities for fights. And really, it's not just the idea of stands that matters. It's how stand battles essentially set the rhythm of JoJo's pacing, for every part from here on. Stand fights tend to take up most of the story space in JoJo's parts, and the plot is essentially just what happens in between stand battles to move things along to the next stand battle. The plot of part three is essentially nothing but a loose thread of keep traveling towards Dio that provides an excuse to move from stand battle to stand battle. This rhythm is what defines Jojo's storytelling and creates an understandable, if unorthodox structure for readers and viewers to keep coming back for week after week. Even if the plot isn't the strongest yet, the primary hook of Jojo's was established with stands. Although that does bring us to part four's huge improvement, which was, well, actually having a plot. Remember when I said towards the beginning of this video that early JoJo's parts tend to be severely lacking in most basic literary elements that people would say are essential to storytelling? Well, this is kind of what I mean. On the one hand, Araki right from the start could think of all sorts of wildly imaginative battles and iconic moments, but on the other hand, basic things like the plot were even less developed than what you'd see from video games in the 90s. In part three, it's again, go stop Dio, but just with extra steps, which is they've got to go through some random countries and fight some random people along the way, but the locations are ultimately irrelevant as it's pretty much just a series of back to back to back fights against henchmen and then fighting Dio. In part four, Araki decided to actually attempt a more fleshed out plot to surround the stand fights. This starts with the setting, Everything takes place in the singular location of Morio Town, it means that problems have to naturally develop in a singular setting over time and actually build to something. For the first time, what exactly the protagonists have to do is not as simple and clear cut. They know that someone is spreading stand abilities throughout Morio Town with a golden arrow, but as it turns out, who that person is keeps shifting, and the golden arrow changes hands many times. Beyond that, the larger problem of finding out who Kira is begins to emerge as well. And this again is not a straightforward conflict, as the process of discovering that there is a killer, finding the killer, confronting the killer, losing the killer, having to deal with the aftermath of failing to catch the killer, and ultimately then catching the killer for good, is a more complex narrative than anything we had before. 
This also allows for earlier characters and plot threads to come back around more organically. For example, the salon owner, Aya, is established earlier on as someone who can manipulate appearance and help people find love. But later on, she is revisited as a method for Kira to change his identity. Not to mention, this is the first time Araki really plays with handling multiple plot threads at the same time. Whereas usually in the past, these small batch of protagonists are all moving and acting together in one singular plot thread, here, many characters are split up and are often acting independently, also providing an interesting dynamic where we can follow Kira, Hayato, and the Kawajiri family's developments at the same time as the protagonists' developments. For the first time, JoJo's isn't just hooking readers with the allure of seeing the next fight. The actual plot is mysterious and engaging. Now, none of this is to say that Part 4 has some brilliantly thought out plot by most series standards. Just that with part 4, Araki is finally writing a legitimate plot, which is better than what JoJo's had before. If anything, because Araki genuinely attempts to write a more complex narrative this time around, it actually makes the many abandoned plot threads stand out even more. Why set up this father that they needed to find a stand user to cure? Why set up this invisible baby whose parent must be found? Why do this weird, unexplained flashback where Josuke in the past meets himself in the future, even though hardcore JoJo's defenders will claim that this guy was obviously just some Josuke lookalike? Right, that's definitely what you guys thought when you first saw this scene. The reality is that good mysteries require setting up lots of mysterious plot threads and then following through on them. Whereas part 4 did the setup part and then didn't do the follow through for pretty much any of these plot threads. Instead, just kind of switching over to becoming purely a Kira manhunt for the second half with everything else ignored. But that's okay, because the point is growth. This was the first time Araki at least wrote a more complex plot, with more twists and turns, simultaneous story threads, and at least some things coming full circle. And I would argue that one of the biggest things that Part 4's plot was missing was given to us in Part 5. What Part 5 Golden Wind gave us is a crucial element of plotting, particularly in a battle series, which is momentum. What do I mean by that? Well, in past JoJo's parts, the pace was always somewhat lackadaisical. Yes, they always have to get to the village to stop them, but not a lot is happening in the story to up the sense of urgency or shake things up at every turn. In Part 3, their plane crashed, so now they're on a boat, and then they're in a car, and then they're traveling through the desert, and the whole time there is the general sense that they need to get to Dio at some point before Holly dies, but not much is changing over the course of their journey. It's all just moving along one continuous pathway till eventually they get to their destination. In Part 4, a lot of it is practically slice of life. High school students trying to figure out how to make a quick buck, or trying out a new restaurant, and even with a killer on the loose, that doesn't mean there isn't time for a friendly game of dice, etc. Part 5 changed all that. Rather than a large overarching goal like defeat Dio, the Pillarman, or Kira, Part 5 segmented its plot out into smaller goals that could each be built to with their own sense of urgency, which would then lead to breakthroughs into even more important goals. For example, early on, Giorno is just trying to get into the Mafia. That in itself is a life or death trial. And once he has joined the ranks, the new goal is a race to get to Popo's treasure so that Bucciarati can be made a capo. This provides a high stakes short term goal. But once that is accomplished, they are then handed the bigger goal of delivering Trish to the boss, which turns into a new race of sorts with the Hitman team. All of that culminating in a major twist at the halfway mark of the story with them now having to try to survive the full force of Diablo's assassins as they try to find the secret of his past. And after finally overcoming that hurdle, only then does it all come down to a grand final showdown in Rome. In part 5, we are constantly being given high stakes goals that separate out the part into its own set of miniature arcs, such that it feels like there's something new on the line at every step of the journey, and every time they achieve one of their individual goals, they get new revelations that are often surprising and raise the stakes even further for them to chase after a new, even more important, and even more urgent goal. Essentially, while the previous JoJo's parts got by on basically just having the characters go through fight after fight for a general purpose, Part 5 pushes the importance of each individual set of fights through a rapidly escalating set of stakes, giving us a far more gripping plot moment to moment. And to cap off the first group of JoJo's parts, the parts before the universe reboot, in part 6, Araki takes a very, very important step, which in turn is what sets up part 7 onwards to be held in such high regard. Part 6 is the first part in JoJo's 
that truly has a clear, defining character arc for its protagonist. Jolene is the first Jojo that is genuinely a different person at the end of the part than she was at the beginning. And I don't mean because of the universe reset, I mean before that, the Jolene that is first dropped into Stone Ocean Prison versus the Jolene that fights Poochie for the fate of the universe at the end are two very different people. Now yes, the protagonists before this, Joseph, Jotaro, Josuke, etc, they did go through soft changes and developments over the course of their respective parts. Jotaro goes from being a pure loner to seemingly appreciating the bonds that he made over his trip. There's a brief bit where Josuke has to seemingly learn to become better under pressure. Even though it already seemed like he was really good under pressure before this and this bit of character growth is never referenced or made to seem relevant at any point again. But sure, you could say that there have been moments where Jojos in the past have changed in some ways and learned some small lessons. But Jolene is the first Jojo who had a complete transformation. And the story itself really is about her transformation. Part 6 is the tale of this young and naive girl being dropped into the crucible that is Stone Ocean Prison, and then growing into the spitting image of her father, a strong stoic warrior with just as much willpower and determination as any of her predecessors. The prison itself provides a great setting for this growth to happen. At first, she is completely helpless in the face of even normal inmates, being bullied and pushed around, with it initially seeming as though it will be on her father to have to come rescue her and get her out of there. However, the responsibility soon shifts to Jolene to have to save her father, and over the course of the rest of the arc, she goes from being the one that everyone picked on to essentially being the strongest and toughest person in the prison, capped off with her actually breaking herself out. And the scenes that probably cement the before and after of Jolene better than any other are her first interactions with her boyfriend Romeo versus her final one. Where initially she is thrown in prison because she is a love-struck, naive teenage girl, the Jolene that walks out of prison is a hardened fighter who doesn't bend to Romeo at all, who actually intimidates him, and ultimately doesn't show him empathy in the slightest. And on the flip side of the equation from the protagonist, part 6 was the first part that also attempted to write a deeper antagonist as well. With Poochie, we actually get an extended, tragic backstory that helps us at least somewhat understand his motivations. Now, I don't personally think that Poochie is a great villain, and it's important to note that a backstory or fleshed out motivations aren't the only things that make a great villain. For example, Kira is very straightforward in who he is and what he wants, but is still more interesting by most people's standards than Pucci. However, it is necessary to note that Pucci, like Jolene, still sets a precedent for the type of writing that we can expect in the rebooted JoJo's parts of Seven and Beyond, with more emphasis on character arcs for the main characters and more emphasis on adding depth to the villains. And so here we have part seven. Spoilers ahead. For anime viewers' reference, this part is a completely rebooted version of JoJo's, and it actually became published in a different magazine than the previous parts, with a monthly release schedule. These factors together allow Araki to not only write a more mature story, but also spend more time fleshing out the story. And it really, really shows. This is the part that definitely took the most steps forward all at once. And while Part 7's Steel Ball Run will be getting a more in-depth video later on to really break down everything that makes this part so special, for the sake of this video, I'm going to just keep it concise and highlight the three key areas in which the storytelling improved. First, going off what was previously discussed in Part 6, Part 7 has easily the best character arc in all of JoJo's for its protagonist. Johnny Joestar. Steel Ball Run begins with it being stated that this is a story about Johnny learning to walk again. And of course this means figuratively as well as literally. Johnny's growth as a character is the most nuanced storytelling Araki has ever done, and it marked his evolution from being able to write a good character arc to a truly phenomenal one. But it's not just Johnny, we see character arcs for pretty much all of our protagonists, as well as heavy, complex backstories for various side characters and antagonists. It feels like everyone in Part 7 has a story. And not only do they have stories, the nature of every character's past, every character's motivation, every character's journey is complicated. This is the second point in which Steel Ball Run marks a huge step forward for JoJo's. Gone are the simplistic days of good and evil from all the way back in part one. Gone is the easily understandable morality of the previous universe. Nothing in Steel Ball Run is black and white, nothing is clean cut. This world and its cast of characters are all painted in varying shades of gray. 
Protagonists are revealed to be repenting for heinous sins of the past. Villains make more compelling moral arguments than the heroes. In this race for the ultimate prize, the question of who deserves to win is genuinely a difficult one to answer, which makes for a far more thought-provoking read than any of the previous parts. And the third and final point of improvement is that Steel Ball Run is also the first part where Araki truly carries through a well-developed thematic message from beginning to end. Some believe Part 5 was the first to do this, I respectfully disagree. While Part 5 did incorporate themes such as fate, the past, the future, etc., none of this was particularly well developed. Just throwing in themes and ideas doesn't mean much on its own. The structure and coherence of the messaging is what matters the most. In this vein, I do also take issue with something a lot of Steel Ball Run fans tend to ignore, which is that in this part, Araki attempts to vaguely incorporate a lot of thematic ideas and threads that ultimately go underdeveloped. But a lot of that extra messiness can be forgiven, as at the end of the day, the most important core theme centered around Johnny and his journey of growth is structured and delivered brilliantly. Ultimately, themes are what a story is about, which is why this is the first JoJo's part that truly feels like it tells a complete, clear story. Literally starting with, this is the story about how I learned to walk again, an initial premise that Steel Ball Run will be written around, a premise that is certainly brought full circle. Even if Steel Ball Run doesn't follow through on all its thematic threads, what matters is at the center of the story, there is ultimately a clear, identifiable throughline that is told from start to finish, making Part 7 feel like the most well-told narrative of all the JoJo's parts so far. And finally, that brings us to Part 8. This is a strange case, as I personally consider Part 8 to be the second best part after Part 7. But simultaneously, I think it does not improve on anything in particular that Part 7 or previous parts didn't have. Even when it comes to the sense of mystery, well, that was something that was already present in Part 4. But there is one area where Part 8 did improve that people don't often mention. And this is a point that is extremely encouraging for the future of the series with Part 9 and beyond. I think many consider one of Araki's weaknesses as a mangaka to be his long-term planning. You can see instances of dropped threads and ideas in every JoJo's part, even his best ones. And looking between parts, there is only the vaguest sense of an overarching plot. In parts 1 through 6, the original JoJo's universe, the only real connecting thread between any of the parts was something like, oh no, Dio's back again, or Dio had a son, or Dio's disciple is around this time. You had certain items that carried over that could be used for future plots like the arrows or the mask, but for the most part, that's about the best that it got. But Part 8 is the first part that feels like a true continuation of the previous part. Part 7 and 8, even though they both feature entirely different characters across a very large gap in time, have the greatest carryover in terms of ideas, and also set up a distinct, central, continuous plotline that will remain relevant for future parts in this rebooted universe. The themes of Part 8 are a direct continuation of the themes of Part 7, an idea that I will elaborate on in a future video. And more obviously, there is the clear continuing plotline that carries over between these two parts, the plotline of the Holy Corpse. We've had MacGuffins in the past, again the arrows or the mask, but the corpse. The corpse is treated as far more important than any of these items from past parts, with the effects of the Rokaka fruits and the wall eyes all seemingly stemming from the corpse, and more importantly, Araki seems to be writing the themes of each part around these effects that stem from the corpse. As such, assuming the corpse continues to be relevant into part 9, there finally seems to be a greater, structured thematic message that is developing across multiple parts as well as a more clear continuing plot thread that will be linking the parts of the new universe together. So looking back across the entire decades-long series, we can see JoJo's as a remarkable case study of an author's evolution, starting with a unique but unrefined work and slowly adding in compelling protagonists, lovable ensembles, engaging battles, suspenseful plotting, powerful character arcs, moral complexity, developed themes, and finally, an overarching structure. Today, we have reached a point where Araki's creative genius and overflowing ideas are more methodically organized and fused together with traditional storytelling standards. And it's been this journey of continuous evolution that has made JoJo such a joy to come back to with each part, as we can always look forward to something new.
And if you enjoyed this video, then definitely like, comment, and subscribe for more videos like this.